Hi everyone, my name is Lavinia, and today I'll be sharing with you um, Filariclebsiella, the bacterium you need to know about. So first off, hi and welcome. My name is Lavinia. I'm a graduate student here at the University of Michigan. Our beautiful medical school campus is shown below. And I'm part of a research group in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology. I spend most of my time in this building right here studying a bacterium called Klebsiella pneumoniae. So Klebsiella is shown here on the left. This is actually a picture that I took of what I work with every single day. And each white sort of circle on the left is actually millions of bacteria. So this is a single Klebsiella shown here on the right. And so millions of these individual Klebsiella make up one of those white dots on the left. Now, Klebsiella is a bacterium um, that's relatively common, but one of the reasons why we're interested in it is because it tends to be really dangerous in certain settings. So hospitalized patients are at risk for Klebsiella infection, and in those patients, Klebsiella can cause really severe and life-threatening infections. And so today I'll be sharing a little bit about my work and what I focus on as part of my research. But wait, before we dive into the nitty-gritty and complexity of the world of Klebsiella, Let's take a step back and uh, maybe talk about a little bit of the basics of uh, microbiology and bacteriology, and hopefully give you a little bit of background information that then can help you um, understand my research a little bit better. So let's dive in. The bacteria, just like us, are living organisms, and they're super diverse and come in many different forms. So Club Sela is shaped like a cylinder um, in that it's shown sort of here on the right, that sort of purple bacterium. Now, other bacteria, for example, can form long chains that almost look like peas in a pod, like the green bacteria in the middle. There are some bacteria that can move. So the brown bacteria at the bottom, actually those have a tail, right, that allows them to move and swim through different environments. And bacteria can be everywhere. They can live with and without oxygen, depending on the type of bacteria. Some can live in really hot or cold temperatures. And so bacteria are super diverse and are everywhere, all over the place. So for example, if you look down at your hands, at your skin, bacteria are found on your skin. They're also found in your mouth, as well as in the stomach. Um, they make up something called the gut microbiome. They're found in plants and animals, in the soil, and are even found in our oceans where they produce a huge amount of oxygen. Bacteria are also really important for our society, so they're vital for producing different foods, such as cheese and yogurt. And have been really important for helping to discover um, different medications such as antibiotics. Now I've talked about that bacteria are super tiny. And so let's try to get an understanding of just how small they actually are. So if we say that a human is the size of a human cell in the body, then an average bacterium would be the size of a football and the virus would be the size of a AA battery. And that gives just a little bit of a, a context, an idea of how small um, bacteria really are. And so you have millions of these tiny bacteria that along with some other types of microbes make up something called the gut microbiome in your stomach. So in the stomach, you have these millions of bacteria that are really important for your health. So they can help your immune system. They can help digest certain foods that we as humans can't digest. They can help produce important molecules that are important for your health. They can impact your mood, for example. And they can have a, a really complex role in human diseases, such as cancer and gastrointestinal diseases. And so that balance of the types of bacteria you have, some can be protective disease, while some can um, lead to certain diseases or put you at risk for certain diseases. And so this entire collection of microbes weighs around 200 grams, which is about the size of a mango. And so you can imagine that you have a mango um, of microbes, right, that are in your stomach that have this really important role in your health. And so bacteria are organisms just like you and me. They can replicate. They can also have something called genetic material. And so every living organism has genetic material that's really important for carrying information. So for example, your hair color or eye color is passed on from your parents to you via genetic information. And so the sort of foundational unit of genetic material is called a gene. And so individual genes carry information that's necessary for some kind of different function. Now trying to understand what a gene is can 
seem really complicated and abstract. So let's try to break it down a little bit. Genes are pretty much like ingredients. So let's say you want to bake some sugar cookies, right? That's really just the baseline simple cookie. So for that, we have certain ingredients like flour, baking soda, eggs, and butter that are essential. We need those ingredients to make just a cookie at all. So if we have those essential ingredients, we get a simple sugar cookie. Success. Just like ingredients um, like flour and baking soda, there's genes that are essential for both human and bacterial function. So there's just sort of a subset of genes that without them, we or bacteria would not be able to function. Now, however, there's ingredients like chocolate chip cookies, right, that aren't essential. We don't need chocolate chips to make a cookie, but they could lead to a really tasty chocolate chip cookie. Now, just like chocolate chips, there's certain genes that aren't essential for bacterial function, for example, right? But there's certain genes that potentially make bacteria more dangerous or better at surviving some kind of harsh environment. And so those genes are considered not essential, but potentially could confer some kind of benefit to a bacterium. So let's review what we've covered so far. Bacteria are tiny but mighty, and they're everywhere. They can have a really important function in the gut as being really um, sort of foundational for our health. And bacteria and humans have genetic material that are important and encode information that's important for function. So congratulations, at this point, you have become an honorary microbiologist. You have gained um, some baseline microbiology knowledge, and we are now ready to use that honorary microbiology degree to dive into the world of Club Ciela. So Let's get back to it. Club Ciela is a common bacterium that's found in the soil and animals and can be found in our gut microbiome. It is considered opportunistic in that it's um, really taking advantage of vulnerable or susceptible populations of people, such as patients in the hospital who might be really sick or have some kind of immunocompromised um, illness. Now, one of the reasons that club sala is so dangerous is that some types of club sala are considered multi-drug resistant, which means that basically they um, are able to avoid getting killed by the common um, medications called antibiotics that we use to try to treat bacteria such as Klebsiella. The Klebsiella can be found in the gut microbiome. And in that setting, it is considered asymptomatic in that you can have Klebsiella in your gut, but it's not causing an actual infection when it is in the gut or contained in the gut. However, when Klebsiella gets to a place in the body that's not the gut, like the lungs or the bloodstream, that's where it can make you really sick or cause an infection. And so that brings me to this idea of harmless, harmful. In the gut or in the stomach, Club Ciela is um, able to be contained and is part of that community of microbes um, that can sort of play a role in your health. Just like a lion, for example, is in a zoo enclosure, it's contained, and isn't harmful. However, if club sala gets out of the stomach into an area such as the lungs or the bloodstream, it's no longer contained with its other microbes and there can cause uh, really severe infections and cause damage. Just like if a lion got out of a zoo enclosure, it could potentially cause harm. Now club sala in the hospital is, is um, sort of where club sala is is most important because it causes infections in hospitalized patients who are already really vulnerable to club sale infection. And so there's something that we know actually about club sale in the hospital in that um, in the hospital, the gut of patients is actually a major source of club sale. So there's certain patients that have high levels of club sale in the gut. And what we know based off of previous research is that patients with high levels of club sala in the gut have a higher risk for developing infection with club sala outside of the gut, like in the lungs or the bloodstream. Now let's turn back to the idea of genes and um, this idea that genes are like ingredients. So club sala has genes, some that are essential, and there's some that are not essential. So for example, like walnuts and chocolate chips, those are not essential ingredients. Club has certain genes that are not essential for all club to function. 
And we know that some of these not essential genes are actually associated with infection. Some of these not essential ingredients are associated with causing infections in patients. And there's certain non essential genes that are tied to high levels of Klebsiella in the gut. So, for example, if a type of Klebsiella has a certain non essential ingredient, it might be able to have higher levels of Klebsiella in the gut. And so that brings me to my research question, which is that certain genes tied to Klebsiella act by allowing Klebsiella to reach higher levels in the gut. So, potentially, these non essential genes or ingredients are somehow making Klebsiella more dangerous, allowing Klebsiella to somehow replicate more or somehow reach higher levels in the gut. So to try to answer this question, there's a couple of sort of um, things that I'm trying to do in the lab. So I'm focusing on specific Klebsiella genes that we know are associated with infection. I'm trying to understand the, the specific function of these genes. So just like we know that baking soda, for example, has has a specific function in a recipe, I'm trying to understand whether or not a specific Klebsiella gene has a fun specific function in Klebsiella. And finally, I'm trying to understand the role of these genes in increasing levels of Klebsiella in the gut. So let's walk through an example. We have a gene called DGCE that we know is associated with higher um, levels of Klebsiella in the gut and is associated with infections of Klebsiella in patients. And so what I'm trying to do is basically remove this gene from Klebsiella and then try to understand that impact. Is that not removing of that gene leading to lower levels of Klebsiella potentially in the gut? And is there some kind of function that this gene is allowing Klebsiella or is some kind of role that this gene has in Klebsiella? For example, does it lead to a less dangerous Klebsiella just like removing chocolate chips might lead to a less tasty cookie. Now you might be wondering, well, why Club Taylor and why this focus on specific genes? Well, we have this, this knowledge, right, that there's certain Club Taylor genes that are associated with higher levels of Club Taylor in the gut and with infection in patients. We also know that Club Taylor is resistant to a lot of current um, treatment strategies and resistant to antibiotics and that we have really sick patients in the hospital who um, have Klebsiella infections and no medic or lacking medications to treat these infections. And so the idea is potentially to develop new treatment strategies based off of the information and the knowledge um, that I gain about Klebsiella genes. So let's review what we've covered so far. Bacteria are small but mighty. Klebsiella is considered opportunistic in that it causes infections um, in patients who are sick, especially hospitalized patients are at risk. And Klebsiella has genes which are like ingredients, some which are essential, some which are not essential, and some of these not essential genes might make Klebsiella more dangerous. And so ultimately, what I'm going to do in the lab is connect these three ideas, bacterial genes, levels of Klebsiella in the gut, and Klebsiella infection, with the ultimate goal of using my research to help inform new treatment strategies for Klebsiella. So let's recap our journey together, right? So the first part of this talk, um, we covered sort of the basics of microbiology and how cool bacteria are. Um, we became honorary microbiologists and then used that knowledge to learn about Klebsiella and some of the um, sort of concepts about Klebsiella and the research that I'm currently doing in the lab. And so hopefully by the end of this, you've learned something and gained um, some new knowledge about uh, Club Salem. Thank you so much.